Okay, uh, so here, um, let's summarize our daily motions uh, that we've looked at so far. If you're close to the North Star, we know that uh, those kind of stars that are nearby to the North Star appear to make counterclockwise rotations about the North Star. So we can see that again in this picture there. Uh, that's our time-lapse photo showing the uh, apparent, it's an overexposure showing the apparent uh, paths of all of those stars, but that's due to the Earth's rotation that that's happening. That's why I'm calling it apparent. That's not real. It's because the Earth is changing its perspective with respect to all of those stars. And the North Star is the only star that stays fixed from our point of view during the day. And the other ones appear, because of the Earth's rotation, to be describing these counterclockwise circles. Okay? And, uh, but at night, if we look along the ecliptic plane, what we find is that constellations and planets seem to rise in the east and set in the west. Okay, and so uh, if we want to find the ecliptic plane, in the sky, what we can do is, uh, there are several methods for doing this that one, this is the one that I like the best, is to follow the path that the sun takes during the day. So this will also be the uh, path that the planets will take at night. So if we go back to a picture of the solar system, looking at it from a top view, here's the sun, here's the Earth going around the sun, and then here are the zodiac constellations in a flat plane, where here the ecliptic plane is the plane of the boar. Now, of course, when we're looking at the sun uh, during the daytime, uh, as the Earth rotates like this, basically it gives the illusion of the sun moving along this ecliptic path. Okay, so if I'm here, I can see the sun uh, setting along the ecliptic plane. But at that same point, I can see this star uh, here, rising. Okay? And so at the point when uh, we're looking one direction to see the sun, we can be looking in the other direction, say at 6 o'clock p.m. in the evening. And we're looking along that same line because as the Earth rotates, you could look at it from a fixed point of view in which the sun seems to be moving in the opposite direction. And the same thing is happening with the stars that are in the zodiac constellations. At nighttime. Okay, so then the planets are going to take the same path. So if we want to find the ecliptic plane, then just try to keep track from a certain point of view where you might be looking, say, with your star chart in the evening. Uh, at stars, just try to follow what path the sun took. And so that should give you 
a feeling then for um, how the planets and the zodiac constellations are going to move at night. So, once we've found the ecliptic plane, then it is of interest to us to see how this relates to the motion of the planets. Okay, now, we saw before that the planets are in the ecliptic plane, and the zodiac constellation marks out positions or angles within the ecliptic plane. So it's more than just what you hear about in uh, uh, some kind of an astrology reading. Uh, these zodiac constellations like Virgo and Libra and Pisces and all of those are real physical markers that can help us determine planet positions. And so um, if you have one of these star charts, and I'll be announcing some extra credit that you can do with this later. But if you have them, what you're uh, going to see on the back side of one of these is a planet location thing. This one only goes up to 2018. The ones that you have will go all the way past 2020. And I can also give you some of this information uh, uh, if you need it for the extra credit. But what we'll see here is that, let's say that we're looking at uh, 2018 and we want to know what zodiac constellation a planet is in. Well then, if we say look for Jupiter in February of 2018, it would be in the constellation of Libra. Okay, so that's a zodiac constellation. So then we look here, here's our zodiac. Uh, Here's our uh, zodiac constellations, and here is the ecliptic plane. And so then we just keep rotating this thing. There's Capricorn, Sagittarius, and there it is. There's Libra. Okay. So that tells us then that Jupiter would be in Libra in uh, February of the year 2018. Now, Jupiter tends to go through one zodiac <laughs> constellation a year. So, what I'm guessing then is that Jupiter 2019, Scorpius 2020, Sagittarius. So, Jupiter uh, in 2020 should be in Sagittarius. And so once we've identified that, now how would we know uh, that Jupiter is in Libra if we just see something like LIB? Well, here below the uh, below the chart, we have a symbol of abbreviations, and so LIB tells us that it's Libra, uh, and then uh, Sagittarius would be SGR. And so we can see then as we go through, we look here, it's pretty much in Libra all the way through 2018, but it should jump to uh, Sagittarius and the, or um, should jump uh, from Scorpius to Sagittarius. Ophili Ophiliuchus is uh, uh, an extra zodiac constellation that's been put in there, but it doesn't have the standard 30 degree difference. It's just kind of used to help to identify positions. Uh, and so uh, uh, when you look at your star wheel in uh, 2020, like you might want to check that right now if you have yeah. it, uh, and see what it looks like in September, uh, a, a 
I think what you'll find is that it'll say SGR. And so that would be the constellation of Sagittarius. So to find a planet then, and, and what uh, zodiac constellation it's in, step one then is to find the zodiac constellation it's in. Step one, okay, and so you use the table on the back of the star chart. And then step two, what you do, uh, if you uh, want to find out when it, uh, to find the rise time, Put that zodiac constellation on the eastern horizon. <clears throat> and then what you want to do is see what time points at your date. Again, if you want to do this, uh, I'll be giving extra credit for identifying some of these planets in the nighttime sky and drawing a picture of what you see. But uh, we're just going through the procedure of this here. And so let's say that our goal was to find the rise time of Jupiter this evening. find the rise time of Jupiter uh, two years ago. On this day, two years ago. Okay, so our next step then to find the rise time, if we want to do it for this first one, is to say, okay, well, Jupiter's in the constellation of Sagittarius, that's SGR. So first we need to find Sagittarius. Yeah, I just happened to already be there because we were talking about Libra and it being two constellations over and two years ago. But Jupiter has moved slowly. We'll talk more about why Jupiter moves across the uh, ecliptic plane from one zodiac constellation to the next uh, in a few minutes. But for the moment, let's just say that we've identified the location in terms of Sagittarius. Now we're going to take Sagittarius, and you see what I'm doing here is I'm taking it and I'm moving it toward the eastern horizon until Sagittarius has kind of disappeared a little bit. Okay, kind of halfway out, halfway in. Not exact, but it'll give us a rough estimate. And now, what I want to do is go to our date. And our date today is, um, let's see, just so we can, we don't need to be this exact, but it's the 10th, okay, September 10th. And so let's take and uh, see what time points at September 10th. Okay, so I've already put Sagittarius on the eastern horizon. So it's just kind of half gone, half disappeared, and half out. And now I'm going to look at that time. And so what time is that? Well, that's about 3 in the afternoon. Okay, so it should rise about 3 p.m. Okay. If we want to find the set time, you put 
basically the same thing except you put the constellation on the west horizon. Okay, so the, the set time, which is something that you could probably see, the rise time, the sun is going to put out too much light. So it's going to be hard to see it. But to find the set time, I'm going to take my Sagittarius now. Remember, it's on the ecliptic plane here. I'm going to move it around until I get it all the way over here on the west horizon, so that it's just kind of disappearing in the west. And then I'm going to see what time points at uh, uh, September uh, 9th, and uh, so that's around midnight. Okay, so that means that we'd be seeing Jupiter then in the evening sky. It would be moving along the same path that the uh, sun took during the daytime, and it would be out of our view. It would be setting in the west around midnight, and then it would rise at a time when we couldn't see it, 3 p.m. Let's try it again for two years ago on the same day. Okay, so that means that I'm going to go and I'm finding in 2018, in September, Jupiter was in Libra. Okay, so that's right here. September, there's Jupiter in Libra. And so Libra, L-I-B. So then we go back here and we'll see when that rises. Okay, so here's Libra. Right here. Libra. Moving that now to the eastern horizon. So I've kind of put it halfway in, halfway out on the eastern horizon. So now again, and this is the part sometimes people have trouble with, I'm just going to find what time points at today's date. So this is uh, early part of September, so it's about 11 a.m. For the rise time. What about the set time? Two years ago. Well here, again, I'm going to take Libra now instead of Sagittarius, and I'm going to take it, I'm going to move it to the western horizon, like that, and now I'm going to see what time points at the early part of September and so that looks like 9 o'clock p.m. That's the set time two years ago for Jupiter. So you can do that with any other planet too. And if you know what the rise and set times are, it'll give you an idea of what part of the sky it's going to be in at earlier times. And so I, I'm expecting that if it sets at midnight, it's probably going to be pretty high up in the sky tonight. Uh, and, uh, and it's not going to change much uh, over the next few days. And so uh, if you want to get out there and check, check it out, um, that's great. Uh, but I'm going to have uh, some other exercises for you to do that you can also write up for extra credit that I'll be announcing in a few days. Okay, so um, that's how to use the star wheel to find planets. You can find their rise time, their set time, and in a previous lecture, we already looked at how to uh, view at a certain time in the evening. So let's move ahead and here we see that the sun follows the same east to west motion along the ecliptic plane during the uh, day that the planets do at night. And so this helps us to locate what we're looking at on the star wheel as the ecliptic plane with what we actually can see in the sky. So at this point we should be able to dial in a certain part of the evening sky uh, at a certain, on a certain day at a certain time and we should be able to find the rise and the set times for planets. 
So here's a summary now of the yearly motions. Okay, so we've been looking at daily motions, but there are also motions that take place over the period of a whole year. And this is caused by the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So the daily motions are faster motions from our point of view. So they can change in an hour or two because of the Earth's rotation. So the stars wouldn't move across the sky in the evening if it weren't for the Earth's rotation. If you turn off the Earth's rotation, the stars look like they're fixed in one spot. But they're not quite because the yearly motion would still be there. It's a much slower motion. It's much slower because it takes a whole year for the Earth to change its perspective with respect to um, the zodiac constellations to get back around to its same position. Whereas it can change its perspective with respect to which way it's looking in a day just by going around to the rotation of the Earth. But with the yearly motions, they're much slower. And because of that fact, they're going to be drowned out by the daily motions unless you look at the same time each evening. So that's the key. So if you look at the same time each evening, then you can detect slight variations in the positions of the planets and, uh, and stars over longer periods of time. So we must look at the same time each evening to eliminate the daily motion. Okay, and so let's try to understand why this is happening. If we're looking, say, at 12 midnight here, 12 midnight is when we're straight away from the sun, on the exact opposite side of the earth from the sun, and looking straight away from the sun in that direction. So if we look at midnight, say, uh, if this is a 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle would be one quarter of a circle, one quarter of a year is three months later. So here, this would be three months later. Then when we look straight up at midnight, we're looking off in a different direction. Okay. But it took three months to get from this perspective to that one, whereas if you're rotating on your axis, you can get there in just a matter of, uh, well, one quarter of a day is six hours. So just six hours later, you can get to that same point if you let the Earth rotate. That's why you have to let, uh, that's why you have to look at the same time each evening so that you're only taking into account the slower motion of the Earth around the Sun. And so, what does that motion then entail? Well, that motion entails uh, uh, several things. One thing is that the stars in the zodiac constellations move from east to west, but only about one degree per day. And now how can we tell this by looking at the star wheel? Well, if we look at the star wheel, let's say, okay, let's go to September uh, 10th 
at 9 p.m. Okay, so that's where I am. Make sure you've got the p.m. on here and not the a.m. Okay, so there's September 9, uh, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock on September 10. Okay, now let's go at 9 o'clock, because we're looking at the same time each evening, let's go to September 11. See how much we moved? How much? September 12th. That's how much we moved. September 13th. September 14th. September 15th. Only if you look, this is like a whole week. You can start seeing the motion of the stars at the same time each evening. But it's going very slowly because it takes a whole year for the Earth to move through a complete 360 degree rotation if it's always looking straight away from the Earth. Uh, so we're looking at the same time each evening, uh, and so this then only moves, why one degree per day? Well, there's 365 days in a year, and 360 <coughs> degrees in a circle. So this rotation then is a 360 degree rotation in 365 days. So therefore, each day is not quite, but very close to one degree. It's a little less, 0.99 something. But it's uh, about a one degree change each day. And so you can forget everything that I've talked about here as long as you know how to work the star wheel. Because if you work the star wheel, you can see, okay, if I'm looking at nine o'clock and I go one day, I've only gone one degree. Another day, I've only gone one degree. Another day, only one degree. Another day, only one degree. And so you can see that just by looking at the same time and then moving ahead to different days, let's say in September, then you go to October, you go to November. So you start to see a different field of stars here than you could see earlier. And we can see that that must be the case here in this picture. By the time that we get around to here, we're seeing the stars on the exact opposite side of the ecliptic plane from where we were there. And so that corresponds then to one degree per day for 180 days. That brings us a 180 degree shift in the uh, direction uh, of the nighttime sky that we're looking. And we can see that again on this uh, picture of the zodiac constellations. We can see that as the Earth goes around the Sun like this, and when the Earth is here, we're seeing this zodiac constellation in June, but in December we're seeing this constellation way out here at Gemini on the other side of the ecliptic plane, 180 degrees away. And so by looking straight away, or at some constant time of day, same time of, of day, but advancing through the days, we slowly but surely get this different view of the evening stars. And so the zodiac constellations then make this slow but steady movement across the ecliptic plane about one degree per day from east to west. Now the planets, on the other hand, move in the opposite direction across the fixed background of zodiac constellations. And since the zodiac constellations are moving east to west, that means the planets must be moving from west to east. Okay. Um, but we're going to need a picture to help explain that. So planets are That word is derived from a wandering star. Okay, and so the planets then can move across the fixed background of zodiac constellations. And so that's why they were given mythological properties by the Greeks. They were 
They had special powers. The constellations were locked into position. That mythologically speaking, they had this power to move across these fixed background of stars. They had that freedom of motion in the west to east direction. And so to understand that, let's draw another picture, a top view of the solar system. So here's the sun. Then let's say here's the earth. And then way out here, let's put Jupiter, because we've been talking about Jupiter before. Okay, now, this year, if we look in the direction of Jupiter, we see the constellation of Sagittarius. Okay. And so, but next year, Jupiter will be one zodiac constellation over in Capricorn. And this is about a 30 degree angle between Sagittarius and Capricorn. And so the apparent position of Jupiter then has shifted. If we look at the same day of the year here from the Earth in one year, because this is how far Jupiter moves in one year. So it moves in the west-easterly direction by about 30 degrees each year. Why? Because, well, it turns out it takes Jupiter 12 years to go around the sun once, whereas it only takes the Earth one year to go around the sun once. Okay? And so if we're looking from the Earth's point of view at Jupiter this year, then the Earth is going to go around like this. By the time it's to here, Jupiter has moved to there. Okay, it's halfway in between the two zodiac constellations. By the time a whole year has gone by, Jupiter has moved through just one twelfth of its total path, or about 30 degrees. And so, if we're looking down on the Earth's North Pole, Here, okay, we're looking down on the Earth's North Pole, and we are looking this way, and then we look to that direction. This is the west, and this is the east. You see, as we're looking down on the west coast of the United States from the Earth's North Pole, this is the westerly direction, but which way the constellation is going is toward the east, and so this is west over here, this is east over here. You can draw a picture like this and put a globe up uh, if, if you want to convince yourself of that. But you know, instead of trying to picture how the Earth looks from a top view, you just put a globe there. You can see that this is the westerly direction, this is the easterly direction, so it's going from west to east. And so that explains then what it was that we were looking at with the star wheel before. That's what the star wheel is predicting for us, is that Jupiter has moved by essentially one zodiac constellation each year. Okay, and so the fact that it's done that allows us to say, well, 30 degrees is to 360 as one year is to the period of Jupiter's orbit, or T is the Jupiter's orbit, period. So that gives us T equals 360 over 30, which is uh, 12 Earth years. So just by observing how far Jupiter moves in angle through the zodiac constellations, we can predict Assuming that Jupiter has a circular orbit, which it's fairly circular, not exactly, that the period of its orbit would be 12 years. And so that's the motion of the planets, and this is called proper motion. So this is not just true for Jupiter, this is true for all planets from our perspective at least, 
when we're looking at these planets, we're seeing them uh, moving in a direction that goes from west to east, which is the opposite direction from the direction of the zodiac constellations. Okay, and so that, if we look back up at the data projector, we see that that is what the second statement tells us. The planets are moving in opposite directions. So these zodiac constellations are moving slowly, only one degree per day during the year. But the, zodiac, the planets are moving across, or in the opposite direction from the zodiac constellations uh, in that west to east direction. So let me give you another example, because I know that this is difficult to visualize. And I'm not pretending that it isn't. When I ask for uh, suggestions on how to make these things clear in the past to students, I always hear that I should spend more time on this, because this was the most difficult subject to cover. So let's just imagine for a second that um, these little cars here are zodiac constellations. And so they're connected to each other by a little uh, rope or something here. And they're moving from this direction. So this is east and that's west. Okay, so the zodiac constellations then are moving from east to west, and they're doing so very slowly in relationship to the daily motions that we've talked about before. But now imagine that this monkey is Jupiter. Okay, so the cars are zodiac constellations. And the monkey is a planet. So imagine then the cars are moving this way, but as the cars do that, the monkey only jumps one zodiac constellation per year. Okay, so the monkey is jumping from car to car like this. So the monkey is going even more slowly in the west to easterly direction. Because all of the zodiac constellations, if they're moving by one degree per day, they get all the way back around to their starting point in one year. But Jupiter only goes through one zodiac constellation in one year. So this is even slower. So this motion, this west to easterly motion, is even slower than the uh, zodiac constellations. and then jumps again, and jumps again. So each year you jump through, so this might be Libra in 2018, and then this would be uh, Scorpio in 2019, and then this would be Sagittarius in 2020, and then Capricorn in 2000. 21. Okay. So here we are here, and so that's how slowly then the motion of the planets are with respect to the fixed background of the zodiac constellations.